Welcome to the Dao E podcast. I'm Robert Kuhns. Today we are interviewing the inimitable Johann Hausen. Uh, he is a Wudang uh, disciple, a uh, lineage holder, and a, an expert in Chinese medicine who is doing a number of very, very interesting translations um, with the Purple Cloud Institute. Uh, Johan, hello. Hello. So nice thank you. <laughs> thank you very much for, for joining me today. Um, we've known each other for a long time online, uh, but I think this is the first time that we've met by video call. Um, so why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and, and your background? So basically, to take it all the way back, I really started getting interesting, interested in Asian martial arts through learning Taekwondo and took it as far as I could. And at some stage I reached a plateau and really decided a little bit on a whim to go back to the cradle of martial arts and to go to China and learn Shaolin. I couldn't speak a word of Chinese, but that was really the door opener to China and many years of training Shaolin Kung Fu. And I met Lindsay Wei in China, who is also a Taoist practitioner and martial artist. And she, four years later, invited me to a program in Wudang where I met my current teacher, Alicia Fu, and I've been with him for the last, since 2008, so for the last 15 years, and pretty much been traveling there every year, except for the COVID break that was forced upon us. Wow, that's awesome. That's that's real determination. Um, so you did mention, of course, that you spent many, many years at Wudang, and I'd like to ask, uh, because... I think that in the the martial arts world and the Taoist world, um, we've all heard of Wudang. It's a very important mountain. There's a lot of history there. I'm personally really fascinated by it. But um, for people who don't understand what Wudang represents, can you give us a little bit of a picture of what it means to practice martial arts and Taoism at Wudang? So for me, I think it's it's a little bit hard to generalize because I wasn't on the on the main site in Wudang. Wudang is actually 72 peaks and I was quite away from the main tourist center. So even like a lot of people have a lot more knowledge of what is actually going on where all the tourists swarm in. I was far away from that. I was on a little mountain where we had to literally hike down for 40 minutes and then we had a tiny, tiny village and have to get a order another cab. So I was sort of in a in a secluded world, but I imagine there are other places on the other peaks where it's similar, where you where you immersed by nature, you are in the forest. It's a uh, it's probably a little bit different than it's portrayed um, by the media a little bit, where a lot of people only see the martial arts aspect. You see a lot of people training, um, also not only soft martial arts, also hard martial arts, and that's in the name of Wu Dang. So Wu means martial or martiality because of the also the deity that is as patronage over Wudang is Chenu or Jenu. So it is it is basically in the name, but there are people who don't do martial arts. And in Taoism, there are many people who also don't do martial arts. So it's it's a bit tricky to to equal Wudang or Taoism with martial arts. Great. So then um what is what is Wudang Taoism as you understand it? As you mentioned that you're in this very specific place and you're learning with with a master. Is it okay if we say who the master is? Yes, of course. I learned with Li Shifu. So Li is a very common name, so it, it probably won't get you far. So usually people call him Du Song Feng, but he has many, many lineage names. So we all just call him Li Shifu. That's uh, how we address him. And he's in Five Immortals Temple on, on Bai Mashan or White Horse Mountain. And for me, um, I came really there for the for the health aspects originally, I'd say I, I had a martial arts background, so I wasn't opposed to it, but it wasn't my main focus. I actually, I pretty much trusted Lindsay on her judgment and I wanted to see the teacher that she found and put her faith into. I was like a blank canvas. I didn't know much about Taoism, I'll be honest. I hadn't read the Zhuangzi or the Tao Te Ching. I, I went there and I was like an empty cup. Well, that's the best way, isn't it? Um, well, I, I think that you should follow Lindsay's advice. Um, my my friend uh, Bill just interviewed Lindsay, and and I was really happy to see the interview. And and you two are kind of, you're really um, powerhouses about promoting 
uh, your your specific lineage of Wudang Taoism. Do you mind mentioning to me what is the name of the lineage and what does it what's the sort of central principle that that unifies it? So the the lineage is really Chunyang, which translates as pure Yang, but it has been amalgamated by Longman or Dragon Gate. So we consider each other being in the twenty fourth generation of Longman. But then Nishifu has many other lineages. He also is in Maoshan. He has a Buddhist name. And there's there's a couple of other ones. There's also an Yishong Pai. So it's a, it's a doctor sect. And But we identify with Chunyang, which incorporates the martial arts aspect. But to really take it back, Nishifu had two main teachers. And one of them was teaching in martial arts. And the other one was not a martial artist. So it's it's not fair to to just limit him on, on the martial arts side because he had teachers who were in martial artists and taught him Taoist medicine and alchemy. And over the hundreds of years, it's the centuries, just so many influences flow in. It's, I don't think there's actually a pure line anymore. It's uh, impossible to separate what comes from what teacher in the past. Yeah. Um, so for, for people who don't know, what does Chunyang mean? So Chunyang is based on the principle um, really of immortality, where your goal is to become a, a body or a spirit of pure yang, where there's not a speck of yin. And that's really where the name comes from. I think that this is one of the more interesting facets of, of Taoism, and that sometimes people um, who come from Chinese medicine backgrounds or who come from martial arts Taoism, or martial arts that is not related to Taoism in any way, um, that sometimes when they look at the idea of pure yang, they get a little bit confused because they think, shouldn't there be a balance of yin and yang in nature? Uh, do you mind telling us um, your understanding of why the idea of chun yang is important and how we uh, differentiate it from the idea of an imbalance? That's a tricky one, but it's an interesting one too about balance. So a lot of things we do in life are actually not balanced. If you want to become good at martial arts and you get up really early in the morning, you could say, according to longevity practices, you should get up when the sun is rising. And we would get up at 4.35 for long periods of time. So what I'd like to bring it back to is what Lishifu says, it's about stages. It really depends on your goal. And he would, he would give us a really simple example if you want. So Wudang is... It's sort of, it's not directly between, but it's sort of halfway between Beijing and maybe Hong Kong or something. So you would say, well, um, if you wanted to go to Beijing, which is north, but you go south towards Nanjing, you're never going to get to Beijing. And of course, you could say once you go around the whole earth, you would get there. But that, that's not the point of the example. The example is, what is your goal? If you want to become good at internal alchemy, then it's probably not of much use to, to learn herbs. You should really do meditation. And... It's a very simple principle that a lot of people forget where they're like, well, that's not healthy. A lot of things that Taoists Daos have done in asceticism is not healthy, but it's for a greater goal. So they don't really strive for what we call in the West a balance. Like usually it's associated with fun too. So if you like, don't, don't be like this, just have a little bit of fun. And yeah, there's a limit of where you can get in Taoism if you have a certain goal with um, a fun seeking attitude. Yeah, I think that that is definitely true. At some point, if you want to really progress, you have to be serious. Um, but when we, uh, sorry to bang on about Chunyang, it's, uh, it's also a personal fascination of mine. And so when we uh, talk about creating Yang in, let's say, let's just um, confine it to the body for the moment. I know it's much more than that. But let's say that we want to create Yang uh, in a physical paradigm through through practice. What is it that, how does, how does your lineage uh, contextualize? Well, if it's, a, if it's an okay question to ask, I know that there are some things which might be off limits, but if it's an okay question to ask, how do you guys contextualize getting from um, the point where the body is a mixture of yin and yang to being able to generate yang? And what's the, what's the positive aspect or what's the benefit of generating yang in comparison, let's say, to generating yin? I, I find not so totally fine to talk further about it. It's um, I think it's a little bit for me, even though it's it's flawed as well to draw a comparison to other religions where yang is the light and yin is the darkness. And the real tool to get there, and I know that schools can differ, but at least for Longman, I can only speak for Longman for no other school. It's about meditation. And without meditation, I'm talking about sitting meditation. There's other 
things like standing meditation can be helpful, but it really boils down to eventually do sitting meditation where you get to a state where it's, where it's purity. And that ties in with a lot of other things like precepts and doing meritorious deeds before that. So you have the help of the deities, but eventually it, it is really about transforming all the yin into yang. And these are specific internal alchemy practices, which you can only get into once you've reached absolute stillness. So it's almost like this absolute yin will then transform into yang and then absolute yang. And this absolute stillness, most of the people who do sitting meditation, any form of meditation, know how hard it is to shut on your mind or get the electric stimulus to a minimum. And I know that Andrew Nugent had, which is a practitioner of, of many things, Chinese medicine as well, he said, one of his teachers mentioned, if you do an hour of meditation and you manage to do being still for one to two minutes, that's an achievement. And I think we, most, most people have sat on the cushion and it's just impossible because it's just going on like uh, chasing your own tail. Yeah, you have to have some way to get there. Um, and, and not only that, but it doesn't, well, at least in my experience, it doesn't end on the meditation cushion either. But um, so meditation is then obviously a very important part of, of your lineage, but there's a whole other aspect of what you do, which is one of the reasons why I've been very, very interested in talk to you, talking to you for a long time. You are doing a lot of fascinating translation work to make Taoist texts available that uh, I think previously haven't been translated and uh, which are immensely helpful to the community. Do you mind uh, talking a little bit about that, what you're doing and well, why you're doing it and sort of what you what you hope will come from it? I cannot just say one more thing about Chunyang, which um, yeah. it's not really on the forefront, but it's it's also the name of Lu Dongbing, who is the founder. He's one of the eight immortals and he's the founder of, of Chunyang. But since it's such a deep principle, I usually don't associate it primarily with him, which doesn't really refute the point I was making because Chunyang probably chose that name for himself as well. And then you obviously have Zhong Yixuan, who's Zheng Yang, and they're both teachers of Wang Chong Yang, which means double Yang, because each of the teacher had Yang in their name. So I find it quite interesting how that worked out with the names. And yeah, they've, uh, your... they've passed it down um, so, that, so that the world can be, some of the people of the world anyway, can be lucky enough to, to find out about it. And your, your next question about the publishing. So basically, it came about um, having published my own book, and someone approached me, there was a book by Wang Feng Yi, Discourse on Transforming Inner Nature. Do you want to do a, tell a little bit about how this book came about as well? Yeah, well, Wang Feng Yi is a very fascinating figure. So I would love to hear about it. And I'm sure the, the audience would love to hear about it too. So basically, I found a little black book on a pile of books in what is the common room on um, White Horse Mountain in, in the temple, in Five Immortals Temple. And no one introduced it to me. It was just very small. It was written into in simplified characters because at that time, I, my traditional characters were nearly absent. So it was easy for me to read. It was, um, and I found a couple of quotes that Li Shifu was using in his lectures. And it just totally reflected what he said a lot of times. So I took this little book and I was sitting at another temple hall of Guanyin in the sun. And I was just, just reading a few pages. It's very, very small. And then I decided after coming back that I wanted to include a couple of scriptures in a work on internal alchemy. And that was supposed to be one of them. So I was like, I can't just chuck in this text. I need to know where, where it's from, who is it by? Because this book had, it was, it was like one of these little book, books of merit that you get in a temple for free, no author, no publisher, nothing, no dates, just the text. And then I started research and I found out that people had written about him, like Sabina Wilms has two books about him, that there's a course running about his principles by Heiner Fruauf and a couple of other people. And I, I was just really surprised that it didn't even include a name when I came across it. So I, I translated that little book and that was my first book, which was published with another publishing house. And then I was approached by a German person who wanted to translate it. And they didn't speak Chinese, so they wanted to use the English translation, translated from English, just like the aging of, of Richard Wilhelm was translated from German into English, not from Chinese as a source text. And he wanted to translate it. So 
we spoke to the publishing house and we had agreed on the percentage. And then the publishing house approached me and was like, why don't you buy yourself out of our contract, which was for five years, and publish your book under your own name and this book in German. And I crunched some numbers and it made sense at that, at that point. So I bought myself out of the contract. The German translation, unfortunately, fell through. That was, uh, I think, seven years ago, like uh, many, many years ago for just the person getting too busy, which is, which is also fine. But then I had my, my first book under my own logo, under my Purple Cloud Press publishing house and had planned to publish any future of my works through that house, but then also branch out. And I must say it's uh, just fallen into place of sometimes approaching people, but mostly people approaching me, usually through contacts, sometimes seeing interesting projects and prodding people. So it's the idea is to have it quite broad, martial arts, medicine, anything in Asia. So that could be any medicine, Japan, Korea, it includes all of them, Vietnam, Thailand, and then obviously Taoism, Buddhism, I wouldn't be opposing any Shintoism. So it's it's Asian culture. The idea behind it is to preserve it because I don't think I'm the best to run a, a publishing house. There are certain aspects which I really don't like, but I did feel that no one else was doing it because publishing a book or pu even publishing a book for others means a lot of emails. Like I really underestimated it, the, the time it takes to go back and forth. If you work with a team, you have to keep everyone happy. And that includes the artist, the typesetter. And even though everything is, is, is set in stone, there's always things that might be upsetting for a person. So you're a little bit of a middleman, a negotiator. And that's what I found my role in. Well, in that case, then it gives you lots of chances to to work on your gongda, <laughs> on your uh, on your on your talent of of being virtuous with other people, right? Um, so that is an awesome story, and I'll say just as a side note that um, your translation of uh, Wang Fangyi's works was my introduction to Wang Fangyi, and uh, since then I have found um, his works to be a wonderful companion. Um, Wang Fangyi, maybe maybe you could give us a little bit of background on on who he was and what he did, because to me he's one of the most fascinating figures in um, let's say early modern uh, Chinese spiritual culture. So for me, there's still lots lots to explore with Wang Fangyi. He's considered a Confucian sage of the Qing Dynasty, and so we have pictures of him, photographs of him, and he's very interesting because he would I would say. For me, and again, it's not the best comparison, but it's like Chinese psychology in a way, where he doesn't use herbs, he doesn't use acupuncture, he doesn't use qigong or any other physical exercise. He heals people through words. And I've seen some videos of people having very, very extreme, intense reactions. And I think a lot of people have seen them as part of the qigong fever and, and just write it off. But it, it's kind of it's kind of hard to believe, but they, he describes it in a in one of the books of of Sabine Wilms, like one of the teachers, where people just vomit violently, and stuff just comes out. And he had a huge following. Um, I'm a little bit surprised that it's still practice for a, a number of political reasons. And I also was surprised when I read about Shanren Dao. So that's the Dao of the beneficial, kind-hearted person. It's, it's just a beautiful name. And it, it had, I think, a, a million or more followers at some stage. So it became incredibly big. And for me, it started with this little black book of, I thought it was anonymous, book of merit. So I, I, was, I was blown away about the different facets. And I do want to go to the north of China, where it's still practice, and actually see people use it. Because the way what you can, what you can sort of obtain from the translation is that he tells stories. And he tells a story about someone and you might find certain aspects that are very similar. And the biggest problem is I see it, it's very confusion. So it's very easy to be like, oh, it's patriarchal, it's outdated, it's obsolete, but that's not, then you're missing the, you're missing the point of the story, like someone pointing at the moon. You have to see why a, a disease manifests. And it's, it's a lot of times to do with what you carry in your heart. So it, for me, it's transforming in a nature and that what it all boils down to and is a big part of Taoism and that you have to work on your character just like you mentioned I I get two people and they're like not happy how they work with each other or they're not happy with me and I really have to step back and see okay where did I 
treat their person in a way that they might have felt the way they feel now. So as you said, it, is, it, isn't, it isn't always easy, but as long as I see the end result and I'm happy with the whole process and happy with the end result, because you can't just say, oh, this book is good, but actually working was terrible. And it, it has to have a good feeling. And for the same reason, I had a cover that I looked at and wasn't happy and, and I paid the same amount again to have it redone because I need to look at it. And I, and I look at it a lot, a lot because I work with, with the books and I advertise them. So I, I was like, this is worth my money to just have a good feeling. And I want everyone who publishes with me to have a good feeling that they say, so that I can say, if someone wants to publish with me, just contact all the other authors and ask them about me. I'm, I'm happy for you to do that because if I'm a horrible person, they will hear about it. So don't take my word for it. Just, just speak to them and, and make up your mind. And it's all, everything is super transparent. Like I give them my numbers and my goal is to break even with every book in two years. And I, I even show them how I crunch the numbers of the royalties, what Amazon takes, everything really. There's no, there's no secrets. That's great. I, I really like to hear things like that. And it's also to me very, very fascinating how um, you were able to create a segue between how um, Wang, Feng Yong, Wang Feng Yang talked and, and practiced and taught people and then how you work. Because this is one of the things that I would love for more people to see when they look at the Taoist community. Um, I don't know if you've had this experience or not, but Sometimes I have the experience where someone will contact me and they really have the wrong intention. You know, maybe they're looking for magical powers or some other kind of power, or they want to get something that anyway, I have no idea about, um, which usually, you know, comes down to either power or money. And uh, what I've noticed about good practitioners, not only of Taoism, but also in Buddhism and people who are practicing you know, Confucian things, given that Confucianism is, is a very deep subject, and it's, I think it's too much to talk about today. But when I see people who have really well established practices, uh, usually, they're trying very, very hard to embody the principles of that their teachers taught them, obviously, but they're also trying to embody the principles that are left behind for us in the classics. And they're trying to embody the principle of how the actual creative power of nature works. And so I wonder from, from your perspective, because I can hear that you're doing that, then um, how do you view that idea of embodiment of principles through, your, through the lens of, of your Taoist practice? Well, it's the most crucial thing. And I think it's one of the ways of differentiating between a, an authentic teacher or a non-authentic or what they would call an orthodox and a non-orthodox. Like, are they really living it? I, for me, that even includes uh, foul language. When someone is very foul and very angry, I'm like, that's not really embodying what they should have learned, at least if they claim a, a Longman lineage. Um, and that's obviously their, their shortcoming, which is, all, which is written all over them. So it's, uh, over the years, I've really, I, I really don't care if someone claims to throw someone through the air. It's uh, not, like, I, I'm... I'm just away from that scene and so I have no attachment to it but um what I do use as a judgment is how sincere are they and and that includes also to um to able to to be exposed to constructive criticism and what I mean by that is it's not um a, a, an attack on the person or anything but if you ask someone where does this come from like there's a school who says sitting meditation turns you into a dead corpse. And I would, I would ask, and it's perfectly fine if it's an anecdote, because then you can just say, my teachers have told me, and that's fine too. But if you say, all the classics say it, and, I, and then I ask, can you give me some quotes of that? And, and then uh, there's a number of reactions to that a lot of times, which that's why I like academia, because it's, it's, it's a critical argument. And for a lot of things that I can say, I can show sitting meditation as part of the tradition. I have no problems pulling out sources. So for me, it's very important to bridge, bridge the gap if there is one between a practitioner and a scholar. And there's some really interesting examples where a scholar spent 40 years researching the I Ching and has never, and he says it himself, he has never divined. And for me, it's a text of divination. That's what gives it life. So I do appreciate a lot of work that scholars do on Taoism, but we need the practical aspect. Otherwise, in 50 years, it's all gone and we're just reading stories. It will just literally just be like a story on, on immortals flying on dragons and we all have a little giggle and Taoism is a lived tradition and it needs to be preserved as such. 
It's it's interesting that you mentioned that. I um if you'll if you'll forgive me for sort of wandering off for a second, I have often wondered about certain historical personages. Um, I think it's safe to mention them because they don't have lineages attached to them, um, like Li Hanshu, for instance, who who made this, the claim that he was the the Ho Shan of uh, of Lu Dongbin. So he's the like the reincarnated spiritual body of Li, Lu Dongbin, and um, hundreds of years, you know, after after Lu Dongbin ascended, and I often have to wonder that whether or not some of these people throughout history, even some you know, very, very potent and, and important people who left behind really good information, that it could have been that situation where at times in the locale that they were living in, some of the the transmission had been lost. And the one of the reasons why they had to um, introduce their background in that way is because they figured it out by themselves. And it's it's an interesting problem to think about because we have the, we have the transmission of Taoism, which has existed for a long time in you know multiple different forms and has come together in in modernity in a very um complete way in a sense because most of the most of the lineages um are intersecting now but on the other hand there's also this problem historically of uh as you say uh something that is hard to substantiate through one of the major methods of substantiation, right? So the way that I personally see it is that the methods of substantiation are lineage, uh, they're uh, actual theoretical understanding that comes from, from scholarship, as you mentioned. And then there's also the ability to, to prove something through, through an ability or the ability to transfer an, abil an ability. And I wonder if um, you might be able to give some thoughts about uh, because before you know, before we started to record, you had mentioned that um, lineage is something that's very important to you to be able to verify, and I wonder if it's something that you might like to to talk about uh, and discuss a little bit about why lineage is important in Taoism. Because uh, you know, in our our environment in Taoism in the West, the majority of people don't have uh, a lineage that is tied directly to uh, to like a temple tradition. And so uh, I'd really like to hear your thoughts about that and uh, how you um, how you come to how you've come to the conclusions that you have about why lineage is important. Lineage is really important because you can you can verify a teacher, and by verifying a teacher, you also know if they are in the public eye what that teacher is about. So for me personally, it's um, important if someone is a teacher of one of the more popular people or some of the people who I don't know where they came from because then I have a very clear idea of their practices without dropping any names here. But you hear one name and you immediately know that it's associated with sexual practices and because that's all the teacher teaches. And when you think about lineage and you think about apprenticeship in, I believe in any given country, that was important to say, I've learned a trade of tanning from this person. And if this was a very reputable person, everyone be, would be sure that your skill is high too unless you were, like you wouldn't mention that teacher's name and you could go to that teacher and be like, hey, was he your apprentice? It's, it's again about transparency and, and verifying things. But when I get a name like Master Guan, I cannot go to China and look for Master Guan. Or if I just said Master Li, you, you, really, you wouldn't get anywhere. But um, in, in the cases where you give your lineage, it's, it's very clear who that person is. You can, you can check them out. You can go and visit them, whether they receive you or not. A lot of times it's said, well, this, this person will never teach you, but you could say, well, well, if you give me the name, at least I can knock on the door and and bow down in the dirt for three days. I, I have a chance because this I have a problem when these legends are created or this myth. And, and sometimes the stories get to a point where I cannot really subscribe to them. For example, when one person says I spoke English, he couldn't understand English. He spoke Chinese. I couldn't understand Chinese. I learned all the secrets like that might be possible if you woke up one day and spoke Chinese, but it, it, this language barrier is huge. As you know, as you speak Chinese, it opens doors and it's not something that you can learn within a week or something. So um, very difficult, very, very difficult to, to believe. And again, the, the benefit of the doubt, maybe it did happen that way. There's, as you, I, I, cannot, I cannot just tie everyone with the same brush, but lineage, lineage gives you, it's like a certificate. When you have a certificate of, um, Stanford or 
Cambridge or Oxford, you know that that you've done your work because you don't just get thrown like just just awarded these these ceremonies like some doctor you might get in a in a foreign country where it's uh, just given to you all an eighth down in tech wonder. It's just it's just given to you. It doesn't say anything about your skills. It's it's very different. So that's why I really value lineage, and I think it's we have it with um, university institutions. It's not something that is just limited to Daoism, and where you really you really tell where you came from. If you say, well, I, I served in the war, then then show me your medals. Show me, tell me who your general was. Like it's it's very simple. And if I then say, well, these guys don't don't want to be named, it already creates uh, doubts. And yeah, I, I I really don't know. I really don't, don't know what don't know what to make of it. You you know, it's listening to you. Um, it just uh, hit me like a bag of bricks. I really. Uh, really appreciate the things that you've just said because there's many there's many nuances to this and I so this raises a number of interesting questions I, I will just say first that one of my favorite um stories about this it's not actually about a western practitioner it's about a practitioner in China um a very very notable figure in the uh in the Taoist community who had claimed in the 1980s to be a, a major disciple of Longmen um, as you know, in the 1980s, it was much harder to verify these things because of uh, reopening and because of a, a, a relative social lack of dissemination about Taoism at that time. So what he said was that his teachers were three immortals that that lived in uh, in various mountain peaks, and he gave their names. And then, uh, you no, know, as the internet became a thing and more people communicated people in Taoist lineages started to look for his teachers and they they didn't end up finding them. Nobody in, they weren't in the register. There was no information about them at all. And then uh, it came to be understood that either this person really <laughs> learned with three immortals that chose to only appear to him for some reason, or perhaps there was something a little bit fishy about his claims. And then since then he had to step back and uh, you know, remove his Taoist claims, and he became known as a Qigong teacher instead of uh, instead of a, a Longman uh, lineage holder. And that's one of the really interesting uh, sort of side stories that we get from what you were just talking about. It's a big phenomenon. It's very important that people can say who they learned from. But one of the questions that I have, which I think is a really uh, problematic question and I feel kind of I feel kind of cheesy for asking but there are uh, a lot of and there have historically been a lot of um, family lines of of Taoist practice some of them are in in Zhang Yi right so some of them are very traceable and you can find you know these different schools that that exist within that sort of tapestry that, that Zhang Yi represents but some of them are not officially inside of the mainstream of Taoism. And uh, one of the fascinating things that I found out recently is that the establishment of Chuanzhen and Zhengyi as the two official streams of Taoism um, is only about 100 years old. It was something that happened during the Republic. And it was a lot of it was based on the Qing Dynasty Re Reformation of Buddhism. Um, and so a lot of, especially in the South, a lot of family lineages uh, got left out. And this is a question I have for people who, who are in Orthodox lineages, which is, how do we uh, understand family lineages of Taoism? And how do we, how do we judge them if they come to the surface? I, I mean, most of them are not, right? Most of them we don't know about. But uh, there are certain people also also in the West who make these claims about, you know, family lineages uh, that they've been exposed to. And it's very, very hard to um, establish a, a rationale by which to judge that, at least from my perspective as a person who's not a Taoist. And so I wonder what you, uh, looking at it from an Orthodox position, what you think of this phenomenon and, and how you would... Um, how you would ascertain whether or not somebody who's from one of those traditions is doing something that's that's legitimately Taoist, or whether it's, you know, as we say, like a side door, uh, a side door art, so to speak. It's interesting. I think it's a, uh, it's like everything you you mentioned that before. It's nuanced. You can't really, 
say anything that doesn't that isn't part of of Tianjin or Zhengyi is is not orthodox or site or it's um I think it's basically how they live it, and I'm I don't know if the family tradition so in Taoism there's a there's one thing that is totally fine or it's allowed to reveal two generations of your teachers. So when someone says, well, this is what Taoism does, they don't reveal your teachers, that's actually also not true because why would you have a lineage if it's all secret? And so with the, the family traditions and you have them in Chinese medicine too, it's the proof is in the pudding. So some things you can't tell by looking at them. For example, if they say they do scriptural practice, recitation, but then they can't sing the morning scripture and they claim to be to be able to, that would be um, the case in Longman, then that's verifiable. The problem is when it comes to a lot of the internal art, someone says, well, I'm circulating the chi and I've achieved this or that. And uh, everyone just have to take it at, at face value. But as soon as they say, well, I can transform my chi and make you fly through the room, then they should demonstrate that on a stranger and not on their close, these like really close disciples, because uh, I have offered someone to demonstrate something on me that's a Westerner and I was never taken up on the offer and I literally would have I would have gone there but I would have gone there with a with a like a, a video team because that's how you, you 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 demonstrate things but when you just say well I can I can fly but right now I'm not in the mood or um, it's, it's um, you don't really paint a very good picture for yourself but I, I by no by no means would say that the family traditions are necessarily side doors it's like it's like anything if they if you ask someone and they said well i'm really good at talismans and then they can't hold the brush like which is the basic that you learn in the very first lesson like even i know that then uh, maybe they still draw a good talisman i don't want to say that but but still it means they haven't been formally introduced by anyone that it's self-taught yeah i i think that's a really important um topic concept that you brought up which is that you have to look at how the person can can verify themselves, right? I do have because you did bring up one thing about circulating chi, and and I I feel like because I have you here and I can learn something from you, um, I I want to use this uh, a little bit for also for my own edification if that's okay. Um, one of the things that we see a lot in in the um, I don't even want to call it the Western Taoist world. But we have to. It's Western Taoism, or you know what what's been called American Taoism. Uh, sometimes is a very divergent and and you know wildly uh, wildly unorthodox place. And when we hear about circulation of qi, at least from from my perspective, and you know I have to admit my own shortcomings that uh, uh, I'm, I'm in a very strange little corner of of this branch of research. But from my perspective, a lot of the time when people talk about circulating qi, um, we do, I think we don't differentiate enough what is modern qigong and what is the more historical historically based practices that have longer uh, longer periods of development. And one of the, from my perspective, one of the major shortcomings of that is that modern qigong has often diverged into a theoretical direction where they believe that your way to to have intention or to take action is a medium by which to cultivate the Tao. Uh, and I'm wondering if you can um, help to edify me, especially, but also our listeners, as to whether or not, um, let's say from the context of Wudang or from the context of your own practice, whether or not uh, there's an important distinction to be made between, um, let's say, modern Qigong practices, many of which are based on older practices, and then, uh, let's say, orthodox or traditional Taoist practices that may involve movement of energy, but possibly also go beyond that. I think it's a, with Qigong, when it comes to Qigong, it's very, like even modern Qigong, it's, it's good because if it incorporates some movement, it will have some longevity benefits for you. But then the problem is when people lie to their students and they say, well, as you said, this Qigong will make you an immortal. And I haven't found it. Again, there's a saying, if you don't find mushrooms in the forest, it doesn't, it doesn't mean there aren't any. But I haven't found a scripture who says, do Qigong to become an immortal. So if that's your goal, then Qigong is not harmful, but it's not the best method either. It's a little bit like if you want to become good at cooking, but you just go running every day, I don't think it's going to happen. 
so I, I'm a big fan of Qigong. I, I think it's an it's, it's incredible practice. If, would I really distinguish between modern and, and more orthodox? I think there's an element where people can, can actually judge themselves what feels good to them. There is a feel good factor. There's something where you can just strictly follow your teacher. So I haven't learned the Baduan Jin. I haven't learned the Gu Qin Shi or the five animal frolics or the eight brocades, because I think there's so much in common with the, with the Qigong and the longevity that do one system and do it often rather than learn three, four, five if you don't have the time to practice them. And when you talk about qi circulation, I, I personally avoid the, the words like neigong. I, I don't use them very much because um, anyone doing tai chi says they're doing neigong. It's become a little bit of a catchphrase. And you could say you do when you sit, you also circulate qi. And then I've recently heard that if you have thoughts, like you, if you use illusions, which includes visualization, you, got, you get illusory results. And then I cannot question that, that person because they will never answer. I haven't come across that visual. They also say visualization isn't part of Taoism. And that, that, that just, I need to speak up. I'm a, I'm a wood element. And I know that that is not factual, but I know that the few hundred people or the many hundred people who read this will believe that to be the case. And from Zhang Daolin to Maoshan, it's there's always visualization. And you have the saying when the, when the intent arrives, your chi arrives. And so how, if you don't imagine it, if you don't think about it, if you don't visualize it, if you don't preserve the, the thought, Sun Xiang, what is meant by when your intention arrives. So if it's just stillness, then there's no intent. So I, I have my problems with that. And I don't believe that to be orthodox. I'm not saying it's not valuable. I don't know that, I don't practice it. But as you said, Intention is really important. Li Shifu says if you if you have become a vegetable in, in the hospital, like you have no mental faculty, you cannot cultivate no longer. You might have a, a flat line of your electrical impulse in your brain, but if you don't have this intent to even cultivate, you're not going to get anywhere. Your cultivation is finished. Yeah, well, you know, I know exactly what you're talking about, and uh, I completely agree with you about that. It's uh it's a very, very strange and precarious position that some of some people have put themselves into by making such bizarrely, uh, you know, very easy to to um, disverify claims about those things. But um, I think that uh, one of the things that that you mentioned that uh, gives me pause and, and interests me is this idea of uh you know containing the image or containing the imagination right what, what you called tsunxiang and uh this idea of, of practice is very very old in in taoism it goes back a long way and i think that uh it would be maybe interesting for for our listeners to hear about um within taoist practices well let me ask you a question uh this is uh I think a good place to start. It, you uh, you translated Da Chang Jie Yao, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so just for background, Da Chang Jie Yao is one of the best internal alchemy books. Uh, it is uh, one of the few internal alchemy books that tries to organize itself in a, in a vertical taxonomy where it takes you from the start to the end of practice. Um, and one of the cool things in, in Da Chang Jie Yao is that there is a little section of visualization. Uh, one of the visualization sections is in the in the dangers of practice section, and then another section is is in another place. And uh, I don't want to say specifically what the practices are, but it's interesting that from the perspective of a very stillness oriented meditation system, then there are certain times when you might need to use a little bit more mental power to either make things happen or to stop things from happening. And when I um, when I saw when I've seen people in the past say that visualization is not part of Taoism, and they allude to internal alchemy, for instance, uh, it's really it's really shocking to me because um, in you know not all of the internal alchemy books, but many of them uh, use visualization very selectively to do specific things, and it can be really beneficial it's baked right into the tapestry of Taoism. And, and yet there are many people who think that this is completely outside of the Tao. So if it's, if it's an okay thing to ask, uh, because, you know, I don't want to uh, transgress over anything that's overly private, but 
uh, from the perspective of, of practicing at Wudang, and I know that you're involved in a lot of things, would you say, how would you say that visualization is important and defining within your own practice of Taoism? So when it comes to meditation, I actually don't visualize. I do, um, I do, I do really, I do really stillness where I don't have to. But I'm not trying to focus my intent on something. I'm trying not to have any thoughts. I'm not. I'm not even trying to watch my thoughts like clouds or flowing water. I try to have no thought. Apophatic meditation, and so in the in the most basic idea of meditation, the goal is to be still. So whatever, however you reach that, if you have to count sheep, if you have to think of an image of one in Mother Teresa, your parents, your beloved ones, the method that works for you, Lisha would say, is the, is the method that you should use. I cannot tell you to use a method then you're not still for an hour, like that's pointless. So I personally, for that, for that aspect, don't use visualization. I sometimes, but not for the majority. And I do understand how it can help people a lot in the meditation practice. That would be one way where it's used. Another way is, and this is uh, used in a, some modern traditions in a, in a little bit of an ad adapted way is to focus on certain parts of your body, like an organ, giving it in the, in the orthodox way would be like associated with a color, with a, actually a human being or a, a governor, someone who lives there. And therefore having a healing influence, you can also do that with an injury where you actually direct your intent again, Ida or Chida, when your intent gets there, the Chi gets there. And that's all visualization. If you don't have the intent to think of that area, then it's not visualization anymore. These would be like longevity aspects uh, again of, of using visualization. But as you said, if you talk about internal alchemy, there's different stages. And there's a stage where you have to use very little, and there's a stage where you have to use a lot, and there's a stage where you have to use sort of half-half. And that's usually what's referred to as the fire phasing for hope. So the fire really is the spirit. That's your intent. That's your that's your thinking. That's your thought. Your There's many ways. Like even the intent the, is translated as ideation. It is your thinking. So in these specific moments of your quite advanced internal alchemy practice, you have to use your intent. Like they compare to different images, like pulling an ox, like someone that's sometimes it's even a yak. There's uh, lots of images. And that's why it's called the martial fire, the Uhu, because you have to be strong. It's also associated with very coarse and heavy breathing. And then on the other side of the spectrum, you have the Wenho, which is the, the civil fire, which um, I like it because it alludes to like a civil officer and a martial officer where you don't use a lot of intent, where you again, it's also described as warming and nourishing where you where you go into that stillness. And so you have to vary between those two to in order to get to get somewhere in your cultivation. And I, I'm not sure if you ever read that um, an officer was both civil and martial, because I always believe that you're either civil or you're martial. You can't really take two roles. It's it's probably too much anyways. You know, that's that is uh it's very interesting, right? Because when we Often another word that's used instead of Xiang, so instead of containing the image or the imagination, they also say Xuanshan, to contain the, the spirit. And uh, in some cases, I kind of like that, that term because it, it gets around to some of the points that you were making, which is that um, when we're using our active mind in any capacity, it's, it's always the same entity that we're using. We're never... It doesn't, the, the use of the mind doesn't diverge from the mind. And when we don't use the mind, it doesn't diverge from not using the mind. And this is one thing that I think really bogs people down in practice because they look at the categories of practice. Um, a lot of people come from, let's say, uh, you know, a yogic tradition or uh, like a Tibetan Buddhist tradition, which I'm not knowledgeable enough about to be, make a critique about. But when I've talked to people from those traditions, it's often a problem that they it takes a long time for them to see oh uh, the the spirit and the mind how they how Taoist practicing people conceptualize those things and why it is that our minds could you know can either take on an activity which is always some aspect of containing the spirit or they don't take on an activity is really really hard for people from from other backgrounds to get that at first. And so 
I think that what you have said is very important because when we look at, um, you know, sometimes people who sort of look at Taoist practices from, from outside of Taoism, which by the way is what I think when we have people who say visualization isn't a practice in Taoism, I think they're looking at um, the idea of Taoist practices from the perspective actually of another school of thought. And that's why they're coming to those conclusions. But I think ultimately that they don't, um, they don't appreciate uh, you know, what is the mind? I, I think that um, we have to, we should probably shut down fairly soon, but I think it would be a great question to ask you um, as sort of a penultimate question. What is this concept of, of spirit or mind in Taoism? And maybe you could, uh, if it's okay, because you mentioned that you really like stillness and silence, maybe you could uh, tell us a little bit about that in relation to the concept of Xing, if if it's okay for you. I know it's a it's a big package, but I, I'd be really, really interested to, to hear your take on that. So there's hope there's a book, a really good book written by Elisabeth um, de la Rocher. And on the spirit, it's it's a massive, it's a massive topic. And I think even say like equ equating spirit and mind, because you bring in another concept, Qin and Shen. Which I mentioned differently too. And for a long time, I prefer to say heart mind instead of just mind. And a lot of times it doesn't work in English. And it just sounds bizarre, but for the Chinese, their their mind is really in the heart and the and the brain just just arrived and much later. So that's really what the heart is. But uh, for Western, I just the heart is just the pumping thing. There's there's nothing to it. The uh, I think what you mentioned. It's really important to see that the mind is, is really the biggest enemy of a human being, but it's also the greatest gift. Because they say, oh, you can only reach immortality as a human being. You cannot, you can get pretty far. You can maybe transform into like a, a fox spirit or something, but you, as an animal, even you cannot do it. And it's very hard to, to come by a, a lifetime as a human. So this is your one big chance to make use of the mental faculty to go all the way if that's what you want to do. And that again, ties back into where's your goal. If you want to have a healthy body, move. But a lot of times maybe dancing is even better than, than some or form of Chinese medicine if it's not breakdance because it's it's really just movement. It's, it's, it's crucial about where can you get with a certain practice. And I just want to quickly say something about the Qigong practices. There are certain, or Tai Chi practices, there are certain principles that um, that need to be obeyed and it doesn't matter where it comes from for example one big thing is if your, your bum is sticking out which means you are in an arched back that's not part of any tai chi lineage form school so you can you can tell that it's either not a very good practice or at least it's not in line with what's traditionally taught because then your spine is not aligned and the idea is to to have everything aligned and flowing and, and even in western medicine you have the principle of the building blocks so you don't put stress on your on your spine and your and your discs. So you can you can tell by that if that, for example, isn't isn't adhered to, then it might not be a very orthodox practice. And other things, if it claims to be a martial arts practice, but your elbow is always raised, it leaves your ribs exposed. So you can tell they do it from a longevity point of view, but it's not a martial arts point of view. Again, not saying it doesn't serve its purpose, but it's your ribs, you don't want to have them open, you want to have your elbow lowered. So stillness and and the, the mind is a uh, I think it's again about stages. Uh, it's really about stages. Like trying to get the stillness, your mind should really not be affected on it at all. But uh, don't don't be at least again. I can only speak to the path that I've been taught. There's so many schools I couldn't possibly know about all of them, and maybe uh, some of the family traditions have a completely different approach. But you need your mind. It's like it, it, as I, as I said, if you get whacked on the head and you lose your you just clinically alive, it's taken away, unfortunately. It's, uh, and I've come to realize now that I'm getting a bit older and I had a lot of old patients, when the mental faculty is gone, the personality is gone. You have someone you cannot talk to, they're very forgetful, maybe to a stage where they don't recognize you. And what's your identity? Is it your leg? You can use your leg and you can still have the most amazing conversations with the other person. It's, they still have their identity. They still have the chance to cultivate. But when that identity is gone for a number of reasons, Alzheimer's, dementia, then 
that's not the person it's just the human shell and the human shell is important that wasn't just like the mind you need to train your mind you need to focus you need to be sincere and you need to forge it like a needle like a big metal rod into a needle but at the same time you need a good body if you die too early if you die with 60 you missed out on maybe 20 years of cultivation that's why we have all the longevity practice in thousand because the more time you have in this precious human body the longer you can cultivate for that's excellent so let's um let's let's shut it down uh, I'm in just a second um i want to say that this has been really fascinating and wonderful and i think that um just as with anybody who who i meet who is involved in this wonderful work i feel like th this conversation if it wasn't um corralled in at some point could go on for for days and weeks and months and and years so i want to thank you very very much for that it's been uh truly educational for me personally and i think that our audience will also find it to be uh very wonderful there is one last question i have um which is where do you anticipate the direction of wudang going in the next 20 years that is really down to us in a way um that's down to a lot of political factors which are hard to foresee but um i just wish for the tradition to be preserved in in the most genuine way because if i teach something and i say well this is what i've been taught but i've come to these conclusions then that student could say you they could clearly delineate what is the tradition and what is the conclusion by my teacher but um one person said you should take 50 percent of the tradition and fill in the other 50 percent and it's very easy mathematical equation because of the three generations you have 12.5% 12, 12 of that tradition left and another generation just above six. So that tradition is not really the tradition anymore. It's just a hodgepodge of different ideas. And these ideas could be very valuable because people come to conclusions, people have dreams, just like Zhang Daolin want the Xiang'er commentary to the, to the Lao Tzu. He had Lao Tzu explain it, Taishang Lao Jin explain it to him. This all happens, but how many people does that really happen to? They are like far and few between. So I think preserving the tradition and anything that's added by individuals that should be just signposted. That's I'm not even saying because people have done that in, in Longman as well, or in, in Quanzhen, Wang Chongyang has done that, or in the Qing dynasty, it was done by Kunyang, and that's very valuable. But there needs to be some sort of record, especially in the modern times when you when you start doing crazy stuff. That person who makes those changes must be pretty great. Otherwise, it tends to fall <laughs> into the, the side path. Um, so that's really a, a good answer. I like it. Uh, and so from the from your perspective within the Wudang lineage, it needs to be preserved as best as possible. Uh, people shouldn't put too much of their own stuff into it without at least identifying that, if I understood what you were saying correctly. One yeah, last thing is please um, tell us what you're doing and what you would like people to be able to see from, from the various projects that you're doing, because we will put your links out. And uh, if you mention it now, then they'll, they'll know to look at the links. Uh, as for now, I'm really trying to finish the first volume of the Longman Qinfa, which is the, the Dragon Gate's Heart Method, which is, um, I'll be honest, it really uh, took me to the very limits of my uh, translation ability. It's a very difficult text, and that has partially to do with the Mahayana Buddhism aspect. And I do have to mention Alan Soar, who is a Buddhist and who's helping me out tremendously. And I have another editor, Mark Offert, who's also Buddhist. And because that way, that gives me another lens. I'm looking at always, at, I'm looking at it from a Taoist point of view, and then I could be wrong because he incorporated so much Buddhism, which is really not one of my fortes. And so I hope that the best of both worlds shines through with that. And then I need a little break from it just to build up my confidence. But I definitely plan on doing a, the second volume. The other problem with it is I have commentary to the first 10 chapters by Li Shifu, but only for three of the remaining 10. And I'm, I'm a person who likes to have it complete. So I kind of feel like I need to get another seven commentaries from Nishifu first, and I don't know uh, when that might happen, but um, I, I, I have to finish it. Even if it sells just 10 times, I'll probably still finish it and just pay for it with my own money. But uh, I don't like a first volume, just like an anime, when it's like two seasons in and then it's just cut off. I'm like, that's, that's not acceptable. Good. So 
we can send them then to 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 Purple Cloud Press, obviously, right? And then as these as these new projects come out, they'll be able to interact with them. But I think you already have also many books that they can they can currently read too, right? I've got so specific, specifically on what Lisha Fu teaches. I have with the one we mentioned. I talked about in depth the Wang Fu Yi. I have two other books which. I like to sort of separate in a practical one, which is the Arts of Taoism, which talks about really stillness, meditation, and, and fasting, or bigu, abstention from grains, but it includes more than grains. And um, it also includes dream and sleeping meditation. And then the other book is called The 49 Barriers. And this is really uh, about the cultivation of your character. It touches upon a few other subjects. And I, I was asked, for more and more end notes from my editor, but I really was like, it's not about that. It's really about your character. Like, how can you become a better person? That's really an easy way of saying it. Something that all major religions propagate. Like, how can I be? Li Shifu says, and I know that um, irks quite a few people. Don't ever think that you've done well enough trying to become a better person day by day. And a lot of people like, and I think that's a modern psychology thing. It's like, just be happy with what you've done today. But that's very easy. Like you can just do horrible things a day and be like, "Wow, that was that was pretty good for today." Like I, I just did what I enjoy or what my instincts told me, or for whatever reason I did them. So Li Shifu says, and he and I've heard him tell off people with big companies like, "No, like don't think you've done well enough because you stop progressing." You you pretty much says that's as good as a person as I can be. And who wants to say that about them? Like this is like the this is the peak I can ever achieve. Good. That's a very good thought. I think this is a good place to leave it. I'm going to turn off the recording now. Please just stick around for one more minute. Everybody, thank you very much for watching the Dawi podcast. Um, Johan is a wonderful and fascinating figure in the Taoist community. Um, he is representing a very orthodox and traditional lineage from Wudang under Li Shifu. And so uh, you can seek him out. And uh, I suggest you do. Uh, again, thanks for watching and see you in the next podcast. Thanks for having me.